also give thanks, Father, at this time for this fruit of iron which represents Christ's blood shed upon the cross for the remission of our sins. We pray, Father, your blessing upon those who are taking this at this time. Help us to think back upon that great sacrifice and protect it this in a way that is pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name, we come to the world.
uh, who's going to be holding gospel meetings here in the next few years and whatnot. We scheduled that about five years in advance. Uh, we went ahead and called him and asked him if he could come and hold a meeting. And he said yes, and this is the time that uh, we uh, mutually arrived on together for him to come and hold this meeting. So it's been a few years since you've seen Brother Brian Hodge, but uh, he is a very good preacher and, and of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have uh, plenty of these flyers, or I guess they're not flyers, they're tribal tracks. But there's plenty of them in the foyer. And I just want to encourage you to pick one of these up or two or a whole handful. Put some in your car. Put some on your desk at work. Put some in your, uh, you know, at home. And uh, when people pass through, just uh, mention it to them that this opportunity is available for them to come and hear the gospel being preached. And this is our opportunity to reach out to our community with the message of the gospel. The, the theme of the week is going to be family and faithfulness. We've been talking about that all year long, but we're going to focus specifically on that topic for this week. And, and Brother Hodge has some good messages that are going to be surrounding that theme to help us to think about our families and our faithfulness to the Lord in our families. Also, just let me mention, we are trying to get started the Pew Packers program on Sunday evening about 545. And that is for all of our kids. And I know we talked about being grade school kids, but really all of our kids that want to participate in that may. And we have opportunities for our older kids to lead some songs as well as for our younger kids to sing some songs and to answer Bible questions. And that is a great opportunity for your kids to come and to have a special time just to get there right before the evening service. And we're going to be singing some good Bible songs. We're going to be answering, talking about the Bible. And this, this Pew Packers is going to be an opportunity for our kids to earn the points that they are going to be earning in reference to the leadership training for Christ as well. And they will be receiving awards and medals and, and things like that come April or March or April, depending on the, the day that Easter falls next year, uh, for their the activities that they participate in in that program. That's a great program. And we want all of our kids to participate in that and to uh, be encouraged for the things that they do and to be acknowledged and to be rewarded for the things that they do in service to God and Christ. And we want them to have opportunities to serve here. And this is our way of giving them those opportunities. And so let's encourage all of our families to participate in these two wonderful events, both the Gospel Meeting as well as our Pew Packers and our Leadership Training for Christ program that we have here. This morning we're going to be looking at questions related to the Lord's Supper. We been talking about the Lord's Supper on and off this year a little bit and thinking about it. And this morning I just thought we would uh, think about the Lord's Supper in reference to some of the questions that many people in the religious world around us have about why you know, the churches of Christ partake the Lord's Supper every single Sunday. That's one question that they have. And another question might be why they partake of it only on Sundays, and in that regard, the uh, the Lord's Supper is something that uh, we hold very highly. It is, in the New Testament, described as the purpose for why people come together upon the first day of the week, why the Christians came together in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. They came together to break bread, and that expression, break bread, is a sort of a short way of referring to the Lord's Supper. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 
starting in about verse 23, the Apostle Paul discusses the Lord's Supper and the reason for it, the meaning of it, and the importance of it to the child of God. Notice what he says here. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, why did the Apostle Paul need to write to the church at Corinth about how to partake of the Lord's Supper? Well, the answer is, is because they were doing it wrong. They had turned the Lord's Supper into a common meal, and in this common meal, every uh, family brought their own food, and other families that didn't have as much money didn't have any food to eat and drink, and so... On one side of the congregation, they were uh, eating a whole bunch of food and making it into a big affair. And on the other side of the congregation, there were people who were starving and didn't have anything to eat. And, and the Apostle Paul said, you know, in, in the previous verses here, you know, when y'all come together to partake of the Lord's Supper, it's not even possible for you to partake of the Lord's Supper because of what you are doing. They were so abusing this wonderful... Uh, uh, opportunity for us to remember the death of Jesus uh, by turning it into something carnal. And that was a big mistake. And so he had to correct them and correct their behavior in how they were partaking of the Lord's Supper. And he said, look, the Lord's Supper is not a common meal. It's a place for us to remember the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus and that He died for us on the cross so that we might have forgiveness of our sins. And so, uh, when we think about the Lord's Supper, uh, that's what we really need to be thinking about and what we really need to be doing. It's, it's not time for us to feast on the common elements that, in, in the sense of providing nourishment for our bodies. That's not what it's about. It's about remembering Jesus, remembering who He was, and remembering what he did. Now, in the right way, then we have a regular observance of and memorial of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. But you know, not everybody partakes of the Lord's Supper every week in the various religious services that uh, happen around us in the world. And some partake of the Lord's Supper every single time that there is an assembly of one kind or another. And that would include on all the days of the week and Saturdays and Sundays as well. And we want to ask the question this morning, is that really what the Bible has in mind for the Lord's Supper? Is it something that should only be observed, you know, on a once or twice a year? Or is it something that should be observed every single day? Or what does the Bible have to say about the observance of the Lord's Supper? Well, before we actually get into answering that question, we need to think about our attitude toward worshiping God. When we worship God, and the Lord's Supper is worshiping God, because remember that in the Lord's Supper we are remembering Jesus, who is God, and we're remembering that uh, He died on the cross for us, and so this is an aspect of worship. But we must remember that when we worship, we are to respect God's authority in worship. Worship, when it's done right, it's not about us. It's about God. It's about what God has done. And so our thoughts need to be upon Him. 
the Lord's Supper is worship in the sense that we are thinking about Jesus and what Jesus has done for us, not thinking about ourselves and what we're going to do the rest of the day or what we're going to eat for lunch or, or whatever other worldly thought might come to mind. The Lord's Supper is worship. And when we worship God, we've got to do it in the way that He wants us to do it, or else it's not going to be pleasing to Him. Think about the word worship and what it means. If, if, if you were to worship someone, you know, the, the idea would be that you'd be trying to please that other person, not yourself, you know. And so when we worship God, we're trying to please God, not ourselves. Now, Jesus talked about true worshipers in John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. He said this, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. You know, Jesus talked about true worshipers. Worshippers. There are true worshipers and there are false worshipers. And God doesn't want false worshipers worshiping Him. He wants true worshipers worshiping Him. And true worshipers are those who seek to worship God in spirit and in truth. Well, what does that mean? In spirit means with the right attitude. And in truth means that we do it according to God's Revelation of truth, which is His Word, Bible. And so true worshipers are going to worship in spirit, with the right attitude, and in truth, with the right action. And that's what we're concerned about as we think about worshiping God in the Lord's Supper. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul wrote these words, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. To please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. In other words, when we have the commandments of the Lord Jesus and we are following the commandments of the Lord Jesus, we can be pleasing to God. And that's one of the reasons that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, he gave the church their commandments for them to be pleasing to God. And he gave the commandments of the Lord's Supper to the church at Corinth. Why? So that they could please God. And that's what we want to do when we partake of the Lord's Supper. We also have Colossians 3, verse 17. Whatsoever you do, whether it be in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. In the name of means by the authority of the Lord Jesus. And so we want to worship in a way that's pleasing to God. And so we seek to follow His commandments. We want to worship in a way that respects the authority of the Lord Jesus. And so that means we look to the words of Jesus when it comes to determining our worship practices. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. Now we also have this warning in the scripture. In 2 John 1 verse 9, it says this. Whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Father. And the Son. And so we want to act under the authority of Jesus Christ. We want to act under the commandments of Jesus Christ. Why? To please God, recognizing that if we transgress and go beyond what God has commanded, that we're not going to have the Father in our life. We're not going to have God in our life. We're not going to be pleasing to God. And so what does that mean? It means that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we need to do it in a way 
that God has commanded. In a way that God has spoken about. In a way that God has authorized. In a way that is not transgressive. That doesn't go beyond what God has said. And so we want to do it in the way the Bible teaches us. Now many in the religious world today simply say, well, we can do whatever we want in worship to God. And what I'm trying to get across right now is that that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach that we can do whatever we want in worship to God and be pleasing to God. It teaches that we must respect God's authority to be pleasing to God. Now, we all understand the concept of authority. There are many among us today who are in positions of authority of one kind or another. Some are you know, school teachers. Some are in school administration. Others might be in a business world in some kind of management position or something like that. And we recognize that when we give instructions that we want them to be followed. And that those uh, who are under our authority, we expect them to follow those instructions. And why is that? It's for their good, it's for their safety, it's for their benefit, but it's also because that is what makes things best for everyone so that we can all get along together and so that we can all uh, work in a way that uh, creates productivity, right? Well, God understands those principles as well. And God being the ultimate authority is, of course, so much greater than we are. And in a lot of ways, we need to do what God teaches us to do from that same sort of perspective. Understanding that God knows what is best and that when we walk in a way that is going to please Him, that that is going to benefit us as well. Now, the Lord's Supper as an act of worship that we discussed earlier is a remembrance of the death of Jesus on the cross. And Jesus was not just an ordinary man. You know, He was the Son of God. He was God in the flesh. And so when we remember Jesus, we are worshiping God. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion or the fellowship of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not communion of the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16. Jesus was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 and verse 1. And so, as we are thinking about Jesus' body, as we are thinking about Jesus' blood, and having communion with His body and with His blood, having fellowship with that, we are worshiping deity and participating in fellowship with deity. And that's sometimes a hard concept for us to think about because we are so self-centered so many times that we think about ourselves and we don't typically think about what's going on in the lives of other people that are around us. We're, you know, we have our own problems and we try to take care of those problems and, and we try to manage and get through life as best we can. And on a daily basis, most people's thoughts are centered around themselves about 95% of the time, <laughs> you know. Just because of the struggles and the difficulties and the problems that we all individually go through. But what the Lord's Supper is trying to get us to understand is that our thoughts need to be directed outside of ourselves more often than not. And in thinking about Jesus and who He was and His body and His blood, God is encountering us in a powerful way to move us beyond ourselves to think about someone else who did something for us and who wants us then to think about others also. And so this word fellowship or communion is a powerful word in relationship to the Lord's Supper because it's talking about 
our relationship with the divine and with one another as well. And you see, that gets us out of our own head to think about something other than self. Paul has this warning also for those who partake of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, 27-29. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 and 29. Now, Jesus has spoken about the Lord's Supper. He has spoken about it. And that's something that we want to respect. In Matthew chapter 26, in verses 26 through 29, Jesus was there with the disciples the night before his uh, betrayal and arrest and then crucifixion the next day. And it says, As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of mine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so Jesus has spoken about the Lord's Supper. He wants His disciples to partake of it. He wants them to partake of the unleavened bread, which represents His body. He wants them to partake of the fruit of the vine, which represents His blood. Now what would happen if we said, you know what, I know what Jesus said here, and I know that He wanted His disciples to partake of the Lord's Supper, and I want to partake of the Lord's Supper, but... You know, that, that old unleavened bread is so plain and dry and tasteless, and, and I, I, I just rather have apple pie on the Lord's Supper instead of the unleavened bread. Now, how, how do you think Jesus would appreciate that? Do you think that, that he would say, oh, yeah, go right ahead. Why don't you partake of that apple pie instead of the unleavened bread? No, that's not what Jesus said. That's not what he specified. He said unleavened bread. And so that's what we partake of when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Why is that? There's a reason for it, I'm sure. But I, you know what? I don't have to know the reason. And why is that? Because Jesus is the authority. He's God in the flesh. And he said unleavened bread and he wants me to partake of the unleavened bread. And so therefore, that's what we partake of. And he said this this is my body. When he gave that bread to his disciples. He also talked about the fruit of the vine. You know, there's things that taste uh, a lot better than fruit of the vine. We have sweet tea here in the South. We have Coca-Cola and Dr. Pepper. And my wife lives by on Dr. Pepper. And why couldn't we just have Dr. Pepper instead of fruit of the vine? It's something to drink, right? And we can remember Jesus uh, just by drinking Dr. Pepper as well as we could the fruit of the vine, right? So many people would say, but that's not what Jesus said. And remember, when we worship, we're not trying to please ourselves, we're trying to please God. And it was Jesus who said, the fruit of the vine. And so what should I do then? Satisfy myself or listen to the voice of deity? Well, I need to listen to the voice of deity and therefore I need to partake of the fruit of the vine. And you know, if we were to substitute Dr. Pepper on the Lord's table, well, that just would not work. That would not be pleasing to God. Why? Because it's not following His commandment. It's not respecting His authority. And it's not doing what Jesus did. And so we observe the Lord's Supper by partaking of the elements of unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. Now, most religious bodies seem to kind of generally uh, accept that practice, even though there are some who use water instead of uh, the fruit of the vine, like the Bible says. And you want to visit about that later, I'll be 
be able to talk to you about it. But when it comes to the frequency of partaking of the Lord's Supper, it seems like most people just kind of lose their minds. And either people do it every single day, or, or they do it only once a year, or something like that. Well, why would we take such care and concern to partake of the Lord's Supper using unleavened bread and fruit of the vine, as Jesus specifically said, but then not listen to what the Bible has to say about how frequently we are to partake of the Lord's Supper? Well, I don't know why people would do that, except from the standpoint that they are simply doing what they want to do, as opposed to what is authorized within the Word of God, as opposed to what God has given us within the Scriptures. And when we look to the Scriptures as to why we partake of the Lord's Supper on Sunday and every Sunday, we find an answer to that question. Now, right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there is this expression, as often as you partake of it. As often as. And that word is the Greek word, osakis. And it is a word that indicates something that is done repeatedly and in regular intervals. Regular intervals. Would once a year be enough to satisfy that uh, idea? I don't think so. When this Greek word is used in other contexts, it usually has reference to something that is done uh, frequently. And I couldn't say that once a year is something that is frequent. <laughs> once a week, yes, that's frequent. Every day would be frequent as well. But when we think about what the Bible has to say about the Lord's Supper, we're very clear that the Lord's Supper was observed on a Sunday. In fact, the very first time the Lord's Supper was observed was in Acts chapter 2. In verse 42, which says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship, and in the breaking of bread, there's the Lord's Supper, and in prayers. How do we know that that day was a Sunday? Because it was the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost is exactly 50 days after the high Sabbath day in the Passover. And the high Sabbath day in the Passover was on a Saturday. And so you take 50 days later, that is 7 days times 7 weeks plus 1 day. Well, what's 7 days times 7 weeks? That's 49 days. What does that give you? That gives you another Saturday. But what does plus 1 day give you? That gives you a Sunday. And so the first time the Lord's Supper was taken in the context of the church, it was taken on a Sunday. Now fast forward ahead to the ministry of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. And it says there, now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul made ready to depart the, uh, the next day. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. And the previous verse says that he tarried there seven days. Why did he tarry there seven days? Because he knew that when Sunday came, they were going to be partaking of the Lord's Supper. How could you know that, the Apostle Paul? If we only partake of the Lord's Supper once a year or twice a year, Paul knew that because he knew that the Lord's Supper was partaken of every single first day of the week. He did not say, hey, why don't you guys come together and let's have a meeting here on Monday or Tuesday and let's partake of the Lord's Supper so I can get on the road. He didn't say that. Though there are some in the religious world today who do that. He said, you know what? I am content to sit here and wait seven days for the regular meeting of the church on the first day of the week when they partake of the Lord's Supper so that I can partake of the Lord's Supper with them. And so the Lord's Supper was first partaken of on a Sunday, and it was regularly partaken of on a Sunday, and that satisfies the expression that Jesus gave, you see, as often as you partake it, as frequently as you partake it. In other words, they partake of the Lord's Supper upon every first day of the week. Now, as we think about this, we recognize that this was the practice of the first a century.
century church, they came together to partake of the Lord's Supper. The Bible says that they came together. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 18 and 20 and 33, 34 all show the church came together to partake of the Lord's Supper. And they came together on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2 talks about them coming together on the first day of the week to take up the collection. Just as they met on the first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper. And why Sunday? Why is that the day that we remember Jesus, His death, His sacrifice on the cross? Because that was the day that He rose from the grave. Mark 16 verse 9 says, Now when He rose early on the first day of the week, He appeared to Mary Magdalene, out of whom He had cast out seven demons. In Matthew 28 verse 1, Mark 16 2, Luke 24 1, John 20 verse 1, all say that Jesus was raised on the first day of the week. And by Revelation 1 and verse 10, some 60 years later, the first day of the week had so been ingrained within the minds of Christians as the day in which they met to partake of the Lord's Supper that John called the first day of the week in Revelation 1 and verse 10, he called it this, the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. You see, there was one day that was the Lord's Day. And why was it the Lord's Day? Because that was the day that they came together to worship. That was the day that they came together to partake of the Lord's Supper. That was the day that they remembered the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. That was the day. And they did it every first day of the week. Every Sunday. Now, if that's what the Bible teaches, and that is what the Bible teaches, then guess what? <coughs> We know what commandments were given by God in order to please Him. And when we do what God has commanded us to do, we can know that we're pleasing Him and worship to Him. Now, many other religious groups will, on the first day of the week, come together. They will study the Bible. They will pray. They will even take up the collection, which they rightly understand was taken up every week. Within the Bible, why then do they not partake of the Lord's Son? And again, there's only one answer that I know of, and that's simply because they don't want to do it. But do we really want to stand in judgment before God one day saying, you know, I know that the Bible said that we were to remember the death of Jesus on the cross and partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. But you know what, Lord? I just didn't want to do it. Now, how do you think that's going to go over? I don't think God is going to be pleased with that answer. When He has given us within His Word exactly what pleases Him. Well, this morning, as we think about the Lord's Supper, as we think about what pleases God, we've got to understand that God has spoken about how we are to worship Him. And we need to listen to the voice of God in that regard. And so why not understand that the Lord's Supper is to be partaken of every first day of the week, and that we as Christians are to observe that, not to please ourselves, but to please God. And that when we think about observing that Lord's Supper, we think about what Jesus did for us. Oh yes, and we make this day, the day in which we worship, by observing the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, we declare it to be, as the Apostle John declared it, the Lord's Day. Now, would you make within your life Jesus the Lord of your life? He wants to be your Lord. He died on the cross so that He could be that person. And to help you live your life in such a way so as to be pleasing to God. And this morning, just as we have proclaimed that the Lord's Supper is to be done in respect to God's authority,
morning, so also we proclaim that the plan of salvation is to be done in respect to God's authority. And what is it that Jesus said? To hear His Word and believe it. Repent of our sins, confess Him as Lord, and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And if there's someone here this morning who would like to do that, in respect to God's commands, in respect to His authority, then we will be happy to help you with that process. Maybe you need the prayers of the church at this time, or whatever need you may have, and then you choose this time to ask for those prayers. And if there's something that we can help you with this morning, you can come forward and make that known now, while together we stand.